Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Katie Rowley, and I'm with the NOAA Central Library, and we are very happy to host the Canals Fellows Lunch and Learn today. We have two speakers, so this will be split into two half an hour sessions. If you have any questions for the first speaker, please get them in by before the 1230 mark, and we will answer those as we can for the first presentation. And then we will do the same for the second presentation before the one o'clock hour. If you are having any technical issues or you can't hear or you can't see the screen, try logging in or try, try logging, logging out and then back in. Uh, with everyone being on webinars lately, uh, GoToWebinar also is having some uh, volume issues. So uh, we will try and help you troubleshoot as we can, but uh, logging out and logging back in usually fixes most problems. But if not, please feel free to chat at me and I will work to fix that for you. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Amanda Lawrence to introduce our speakers. Thank you. So our first speaker is Christine Bassett. Christine is a PhD candidate in geological sciences at the University of Alabama and utilizes stable isotope geochemistry to reconstruct paleoclimate and paleoceanographic conditions in the North Pacific Ocean over the last 10,000 years. She's currently a marine policy assistant in the Ocean of Observations at the National Weather Service, where she is working on the strategic plan for the World Meteorological Oceans Organization Standing Committee for Marine Meteorological and Oceanographic Services. Her talk today is titled Shelfies from Shellfish, what butter clams can and can't tell us about paleo environmental conditions. Uh, and I will turn it over to Christine. Okay, thank you, Amanda, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you um, to all of you that have carved out a little bit of time to listen to me talk about a slice of my PhD research at the University of Alabama. Um, I'm working with a rather inter interdisciplinary team of archeologists and geoscientists to create high resolution reconstructions of changes in past ocean and climate conditions in the Aleutian Islands over the last 5,000 years or so. And then we want to compare those changes to shifts in biological communities to see how those communities have responded to environmental um, stressors and changes through time. And so my part of this puzzle is to contribute to the baseline environmental data uh, for this project so that the archeologists on the team can then go back and compare changes in assemblages um, from the sites that we'll be comparing um, in the future. And so with every presentation, I like to try to start with a little bit of a story. And so today I wanted to tell you a story about the blob. But of course, if you're following environmental developments in the North Pacific, you probably know that I'm not talking about this blob. I'm in fact talking about this blob. So in the fall winter of 2014, um, there was a rather large anomalously warm body of water in the North Pacific Ocean. And you saw a repeat of this event in September 2019. And we, as you probably know, we refer to these events as marine heat waves. And those marine heat waves, um, you know, these anomalously warm temperatures are conducive to negative environmental consequences that many of us have likely heard of. So this is an image of Alexandrium cat catinella, the infamous bacteria responsible for many of the harmful algal blooms in the North Pacific Ocean. And it's also the bacteria that produces saxitoxin, which if consumed will likely land you in the hospital with paralytic shellfish poisoning. These warmer waters are also wreaking havoc on the base of the North Pacific food web with krill and copepods doing particularly poorly during this latest marine heat wave. This background picture is a picture that I took last August during my last field trip to Dutch Harbor and these krill stretched along the entire beach. And it was a pretty startling thing to observe. It's not anything that I had seen in my previous field seasons up in the Aleutians. And these changes that we're witnessing in the Bering Sea are likely unprecedented, but it does beg the question, how have these environments changed throughout recent geologic history? And how have the local ecosystems responded to those changes? And so the geoscience community in general has a really broad toolkit of many archives and proxies that we use to measure these kinds of environmental change. This is an example from the Southern Bering Sea that reconstructs sea surface temperature over the last 22,000 years using data from geochemical proxies and diatom assemblages. These chronologies of change are excellent for contextualizing many of the environmental changes that we're witnessing today. However, depending on the sediment deposition rates, their resolution is often centennial. Sometimes they can be decadal if we're lucky. 
And this course resolution often is just not sufficient to address questions about ecosystem responses um, to changes in environmental conditions. Because when you have such an amount of time averaging, you lose some of those more extreme end members, such as higher temperatures or increased freshwater discharge, um, which in many cases are the stressors that we're trying to understand um, in, in different uh, biological communities. However, there's another source of environmental archives that's increasingly utilized in the geosciences to, refined our, to refine our understanding of past environmental change. And that's in the trash middens left behind by people living in these places over the last several thousand years. So this is a picture of an Unangan man um, cod fishing in Unalaska in 1872. And it's, it's quite representative of the rich history of maritime culture in the Aleutian Islands. Um, the middens from people living along these islands can date back as old as around 8,000 years and contain the remains of the resources they relied on to survive. So those remains include things like fish, marine mammals, seabirds, and my favorite, shellfish. And the shells from marine invertebrates in these middens can provide a unique opportunity to reconstruct past environmental conditions. And when those shells come from archaeological middens, we can compare those reconstructions to changes in resource use, and also in many cases, changes in culture. So I would be remiss um, not to include a shelfie in my presentation, since it is, of course, in the title of my presentation. And just like the selfies that we take to document the way we live and the world around us, shells also record that information about their environment and their own response to it. So you might not immediately know what a sclerochronologist is, but from this picture, you can probably tell that it's a scientist who spends a lot of time in a lab analyzing shells, and that occasionally this particular scientist finds the time to not look like she just wandered in from a day of fieldwork. But rather than use a camera, shellfish use chemical and physiological signals recorded in their shells to tell their story. And their shells are made by sequentially secreting biogenic car calcium carbonate, much like tree rings make their rings in accordance with the environment that they're living with. And those shells are also laced with organic material built from the food that they eat. And from this shell, we can analyze a wide array of chemical and physical properties to build chronologies of an equally wide array of environmental variables. And so for my dissertation research, I am focused mostly on temperature and salinity, which can also help us infer precipitation. And I'm also interested in changes in seasonality. To reconstruct temperature and salinity, we use something called a paleothermometry equation that relies on a known relationship between the stable oxygen isotopes of the ambient water, the water temperature, and the oxygen isotopes in the shell. When we have the oxygen isotopes of the shell, we can make inferences about the chemistry of the ambient water known from measurements to, about ca to back calculate sea surface temperature. And so this equation is one of several equations that are commonly used to do this. But what you really need to take away from this is that the more negative the signal, the warmer or fresher the water was that the shell was growing in. And then the more positive signal would indicate a colder or saltier um, environment. And so for every one per mil shift in water, you'll see a one per mil shift in the shell value. And similarly, for every one degree shift in, uh, in water temperature, you'll see a 0.25 per mil shift in the shell, the shell value. And you'll want to remember this because this will help you understand the data that I'll show you shortly. So one of the most abundant and well-preserved shellfish in archaeological middens is Saxodomus gigantiae, known as the butter clam. And Saxodomus gigantiae um, is, a, is a valuable species of um, shellfish because it has a very wide biogeographic range, um, living in habitats from San Francisco Bay to the Aleutian Islands. It has a lifespan of about 20 to 30 years, and so you can get a, a relatively long chronology depending on the resolution that you'd like to achieve. And it's also notable because, like tree rings, um, these shells will put down annual and lunar daily growth indicators, and so you can actually gauge where you are throughout the lifetime of this organism based on those physiological um, indicators. Something else that's important to note about the species is that they have a temperature tolerance of uh, five to six degrees Celsius as their minimum. And so they don't typically like to grow in water temperature that's colder than that. 
And then they tend to hang out in sandy, gravel, and low intertidal zones and only burrow to about 20 to 30 centimeters. And of course, the most important thing is that they're incredibly abundant in the archaeological record. And so what that means is that in archaeological sites that um, span across the Pacific Northwest, we can get temperature and water reconstructions and environmental reconstructions from those archaeological sites um, throughout the archaeological record. So in many cases, again, that's as long as 10,000 to sometimes 13, 14,000 years old. And so a study published in 2005 examined how well these oxygen isotopes were recorded in multiple specimen of live collected butter clams and found that the oxygen isotopes shown by the black filled circles here only vary uh, within about 0.8 per mil of each other, demonstrating that they're a pretty reliable proxy for environmental data and there's little variability between individuals. In 2009, a more comprehensive study was published that used a paleothermometry equation to reconstruct sea surface temperature from shell oxygen isotopes and then compared those values to satellite measurements of sea surface temperature. And you can see from this graph above that, that it was a fairly reliable reconstruction, but there are still some uncertainties. And part of that is likely because when you're using the satellite um, observations as a proxy for sea surface temperature, you're not getting that in situ temperature value. And the other reason that there are differences in the reconstruction versus the observed um, temperature is that we often make assumptions about the delta 18O value of the water based on one value, but in reality that delta 18O of the water is, is varying seasonally depending on freshwater input, particularly in spring and summer. And so then finally, as part of my master's work, I compared all of the published oxygen isotope values from studies including butter clams. And I found that oxygen isotopes became more positive as we moved into higher latitudes which suggests that this trend may be more strongly influenced by temperature rather than freshwater alone. I didn't find that the same relationship in the oxygen isotope minima existed because these minima typically occur in the spring or early summer when freshwater input is high, particularly along the British Columbian and Pacific Northwest coastline where you have large uh, rivers dumping freshwater into the estuaries. However, one of the more interesting findings was that when I compared the number of daily growth bands recorded from shells at each site, um, I found that the specimen collected at higher latitudes were growing fewer days out of the year than those collected further south. And so that demonstrates that these growth characteristics could be a strong proxy for changes in seasonality. And so for my doctoral research, I've moved west to the Aleutian Islands because there's some interesting questions and in changes in sea ice extent and environment um, throughout the last 5,000 years. Um, and some consequent changes in animal, animal populations. And so I think that these butter clams um, can help answer some of those questions by providing high resolution environmental reconstructions for comparison. And so my goal for my dissertation is twofold, um, for the first chapter at least, is, is first I wanted to test the fidelity of the widely used paleothermometry equations on temperature reconstructions with my butter clams to make sure that that temperature um, stands for my particular species of clam. And I also wanted to have a better control on the seasonal variability of the oxygen isotopes in the water so that I'm not just relying on that one value to make an assumption for the entire year. Um, and then to do that, I traveled to Dutch Harbor and selected two sites to sample. Um, one of them was at uh, Dutch Harbor proper uh, at the Spitz, site number one. And the second one is a site called Little South America, named for the shape uh, at site number two that looks like the continent of South America. Um, and to test this question of uh, the relationship between water chemistry, temperature, and shell chemistry, we, uh, we installed temperature loggers that would record sea surface temperature for the following three years. We also worked with Melissa Good, the local Sea Grant agent, to collect weekly water samples that would allow us to better control for that seasonal variability in water chemistry. And then I returned three years later to collect live samples of butter clams so they could compare the oxygen isotopes in their shells to the observational data that we had been collecting for the previous three years. And so to collect the clams, I employed two different sampling strategies. Um, Sampling for butter clams in, on, on Alaska was not the same experience that I had in Kodiak, where you had these large tidal flats where you could easily dig um, holes into the sediment to find your clams. And so um, I dove for many of my clam samples, and the most reliable strategy was actually relying on Pycnopodia sea stars that feast on butter clams and flipping them over to see if they were, in fact, eating a clam and taking their dinner, which I'm sure they much appreciated.
The other strategy that I employed was trying to do the same strategy that I had done in my master's thesis on Kodiak, where I would dig holes and collect clams from the same clam bed. And then I brought all of those samples back to Alabama, where I would sample them from the ventral margin or the edge of the shell, the growing edge of the shell, where the last growth occurred before I killed each of the shells, um, and then sampled towards the umbo, using the annual growth bands to ensure that I included at least one winter in my data. And so to date, I've sampled three shells per site, and I've taken a total of um, between 80 and 100 samples per shell. And comparing the number of samples per shell to my preliminary temperature data, I've determined that I have about fortnightly resolution on my data. And so the first thing to note here um, is that the oxygen isotope values at the ventral margin, so to the left of my, of my axes here, um, representing the last state of growth again, are remarkably similar among the three shells that I measured. Only um, all of them are approximately negative 0.5 per mil. I also noticed that it's likely that the um, isotope values are actually recording freshwater pulses and or major precipitation events demonstrated by the negative isotopic excursions um, in my values. I also observed that for the first winter peak in isotope values, there was only about a 0.2 per mil difference among my specimens, so they're pretty reliably recording those winter values. And then I, finally, I was able to identify clear winter cessation indicated by sharp peaks in isotope values. But then there were some um, that, were, that were less clear. So for example, the 1.7 per mil value um, for sample US4 doesn't have a clear peak um, that you see in some of the other samples. And that might indicate that the winter temperatures were likely fluctuating above that five to six degrees Celsius growth threshold for those better clams. And so at Little South America, the results are similar, but with some noticeable differences. Um, I didn't have as nice of an agreement in my isotopic values um, at the date of sacrifice. So they ranged from between negative 0.2 to negative 0.6. Um, but that, you know, for an environmental reconstruction, that's probably not gonna cause too many problems. There's a little bit more variability and that last little bit of growth in the shell. So the, the curves don't match up as nicely as they did from the shells that I had dug from the same clam bed. Just like my other site, I had seen evidence of winter growth cessation sometimes, but there were other peaks, um, for example, in sample LSAR1, uh, that it wasn't as obvious where those winter cessation would be. And this is gonna be important later because I'll use these peaks to help me help guide me measure those daily growth bands to determine how many days out of the year these shells were growing. And so finally, I think that the site in general, particularly sample LSA3, might have been more freshwater influenced because you see uh, much more of these negative, uh, these negative isotopic excursions. And I think that some of the variability in the sample or the data from the site is probably a result from these naughty, naughty Pycnopodia sea stars. Um, so I was changing depths a little bit and I was collecting um, clams from multiple different places uh, along the coastline rather than one singular clam bed as I had at the previous site. And so we can apply a similar method on archeological samples from Dutch Harbor to help us um, reconstruct some of these same variables throughout the archeological record and the geologic history. Um, but rather than sampling the surface of the shell, I sample and cross section to reduce the likelihood of sampling chemically altered shell material um, from weathering. And so I bisect my shells so that way I can um, see those annual growth bands clearly and use those to guide my sampling strategy, both for the isotopic measurements and any growth measurements that I do. And so when I look at the isotopic values from preliminary analyses from my archaeological samples, I see that they look a lot like my modern values, where you have the maximum hovering around uh, two per mil and then the minimum is a little bit more variable. To, it's still approximately between uh, negative two um, to 0.1, or sorry, negative 0.2 to 0.1 per mil. And you see a similar thing when you look at a site from a different age where the isotopic values are pretty similar. But what you can see between these sites is that there are some differences in the shapes of the curve. Just like um, the curves from my modern values, you can see that it looks like some of these sites might have been influenced by more frequent freshwater incursions relative to other sites. But the isotopic values alone won't tell a story. And so the next step for me is to compare this data um, from my modern samples to the temperature and water chemistry observations to make sure that I do have a really good handle on those paleothermometry equations before I apply it to my archeological samples. 
but I also plan to compare my data um, to precipitation records for Dutch Harbor to see if um, some of those negative excursions in my modern shells overlap with precipitation events. And then I also plan to analyze the number of lunar daily growth bands um, between each of those winter peaks indicated by the oxygen values to both determine how many days out of the year my specimen grew and to also confirm that fortnightly temporal resolution um, in my sampling. And so um, the stable isotopes between modern and archaeological samples do have those notable differences. Um, and there are some challenges and opportunities uh, related to using this method to reconstruct um, paleo environments or environments in the past. And some of the challenges are that these clams cease growth at five to six degrees Celsius. So we'll never know what the actual winter minimum temperature is. We'll only know when it reaches approximately five to six degrees. So again, you know, it's, it's useful to know what those extreme values are but we can get at some of the values in the summertime. Another challenge is that paleothermometry cannot really distinguish well between hot or fresh water in estuarine environments because hot and fresh water both give you those negative excursions. But one way we can get around this challenge is looking at how many um, values are leading down to those negative excursions. So for example, in some of my data, you would notice that uh, there's only one point that was extremely negative surrounded by more positive points, and that would be more likely to indicate um, an immediate freshwater input rather than a gradually de or gradually increasing temperature. The other challenge is that we can't confidently determine the provenance of archaeological shells. And so this is this is one of the things of working with um, data that is interpreted through a human lens. And that, you know, we don't know if if some of these shells come from different bays or if, you know, somebody has collected one shell and thrown it in the trash midden, or if they're doing the same thing that I did and digging a pit and collecting, you know, 10 to 15 shells at a time. Um, so we have to think uh, a little bit about human behavior and interpreting some of our results. But some of the strengths are that we can qualitatively um, characterize freshwater influence via precipitation. And, you know, using this, um, using my method of trying to understand that seasonal variability in Delta 18 we can also start to tease apart um, some of the influences of temperature versus the freshwater input. Um, another strength is that clam growth can provide an estimate for the length of its growing season. So just like I found in my master's thesis, there are differences in the number of days that these organisms are growing in accordance to the temperature of the water that they're, that they're growing in. And so if we're looking at archeological sites from different time periods, we can compare the number of days that shells were growing from one site to the number of days that shells were growing from another site to infer differences in seasonality through time. And then another strength is that um, there are changes in the length of those growing seasons noted in, noted in the archeological shells. Um, and so that can be a really powerful tool, especially when you start to compare it to some of the um, biological remains from marine fauna, such as mammals, fish, and birds to see how they correspond to changes in, changes in those populations. And so with that, I just wanted to make a couple of acknowledgements to all the different people that have made this work possible. Um, it is an extraordinary large amount of work to prepare all of those samples. And so I would not be doing, um, especially my undergraduate assistants justice by not acknowledging that. Um, and so with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, if anyone has a question, please place that in your question panel now and we are going to try and grab all of those before the 12 30 mark if we don't have any questions coming in or you would like to email with christine offline um, her email is down at the bottom of this bottom right hand corner of this slide as you can see if there are no questions we will take a brief pause and move on to our next speaker. But I'm going to give everyone another 30 seconds to formulate their thoughts. Okay, we do have one question come in. Christine, did you consider looking at elemental composition to consider salinity? Did you consider looking? Oh, yeah, same question. Yeah, so that is that is something that um, a lot of people who use bivalves as a proxy for different environmental variables um, will do. But there's a lot of debate as to how reliable those are because it's not entirely clear where um, different elements are accommodated in the shell and if there's any exchange with the environment um, in the shell. 
Great. Next question. Is there any interaction between salinity and temperature effects on the 18O value or are they additive? Yeah, so that's something that I hope to sort of tease apart when I look at my um, my water chemi chemistry values versus my temperature values. Um, but I think uh, I would be able to answer that more confidently after after looking at how those have varied um, in relation to the shell chemistry. Got it. Next question, and I hope I uh, interpret this correctly. Did you sample beds from the M side of the Alaska Peninsula, north side of the AK Peninsula? Uh, well, so it wasn't actually on the Alaska Peninsula, but I was sampling um, more on the north side of the island, so facing the Bering Sea. Thank you. Any more questions? Giving everyone 30 seconds to type. Awesome, we do have another question. How can knowledge of past environments help our ecosystems today? That's a really good question. I think that um, it's, it's a little bit easier or I shouldn't say easier. I think that having a knowledge of how our past environments look help us better understand what that environmental baseline might have looked like. And it might also help us understand how different um, marine populations have responded to different environmental stressors. So changes in sea ice conditions or changes in temperature variability or changes in salinity. Um, so that can sort of help us better understand what we're observing today with that historical perspective. Great, thank you. Okay, I am not seeing any more questions at this time. So we're going to take a quick pause and switch over to our next presenter. So everyone, please, if you would like to stay for the next presentation, hold on and we will switch over. Thank you so much, Christine.